Um, well, we are in our series, God's Story from Beginning to End. We started in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, and we've encountered some uh, different characters and, and um, seen how God was moving from the beginning of time. And today, we're going to look at a man called Noah. Before we get to that, um, I really like stories. I really like a well-crafted story. I like fiction. I like nonfiction. I like mystery and intrigue. I like the beauty of words. I like things that are um, uh, yeah, well-crafted. The words put together in a way that just captures me. When I was younger, there was an American radio broadcaster um, who was on the air for probably 70 years. He just died a couple years ago at the age of 90, I think. And his name was Paul Harvey. And you're probably all too young to have ever heard of him, so I'm going to tell you about him. Um, he did, a, among other things, he did a radio broadcast six days a week for more than 30 years that was about three to four minutes long. There he is. And um, it was called The Rest of the Story. And in these little radio snippets, he would tell a story. A story, uh, and it would have some little known facts or information on a variety of subjects, often people. Um, and the key element of the story, he would save till the very end. So maybe the person's name or who this story was about. So he would weave this tale and he would capture your imagination. And right before the end, he would tell you that this is about, and he would name the character. And then he'd have his catchphrase. The tagline at the ever, end of every story was, and now you know the rest of the story. Paint a picture, the big reveal, who he was talking about, and now you know the rest of the story. They were short, he did them for years, each one was captivating. But once you heard it once, and you knew the end of the story, it lost its intrigue, it lost its power over you, because you knew who it was about. Once you already knew the rest of the story, you could lose all the, the, the other words that would have initially kind of grabbed onto you. Well, today we're going to talk about Noah. What does this have to do with Noah? Well, I think there's a few stories in the Bible that are familiar and really familiar, not just to people in the church. Some of these, like Noah, who we're going to talk about today, I think people outside of church, didn't grow up in the church, probably have some idea of Noah. Now, how do I know this? Well, I did what every good researcher did. I went to Amazon. And I put in the Amazon search bar, Noah's Ark. Did you know that there's more than 10,000 items available? under that search of Noah's Ark. There are books, movies, the things you would expect, uh, kids' books, video games, toys, blankets and bedding if you would like to redo your room, wall hangings, birdhouses, dishes, wall clocks, uh, cake pans, puzzles, cell phone cases, you're getting the point, a bib for your dog, a necktie, jewelry, a teapot, you get the point. I think there's lots of people who, whether they know anything about any other Bible story, have seen a picture that looks like this and know something about a boat with a lot of animals on it. And I know that when you know a story well, or when you think you know a story well, when I know the rest of the story, I probably don't do the things with that story that I should. Because I've lost the sense of wonder, I quit asking questions. If I've read a book before and I know the ending, I've lost the mystery and the intrigue of that story. I can lose sight. When I know a story, and I'm going to really think this through together with you about Noah. Because when I know a story like about someone like Noah, when I know it well, I lose the sight, I lose sight of his humanity. That he was a man that really did walk on the earth, that he had thoughts, and that he had feelings and emotions. The other thing I can do is, when I read a story that maybe fits on half of a page in the Bible, I can lose sense of the passage of time. And this is going to be key for our story today, because we're going to read 
part of Genesis. The story of Noah is actually Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9, but we're just going to read a portion of chapter 6. And I'm going to read it, and it's going to take less than three minutes. And yet this is, scholars say, 60, 70, perhaps 100 years of a man's life. And I want each of us to bear that in mind today, because we're going to maybe look at what's not said, and we're going to think about that time, that 60, 70 years in a human being's life, and ask some questions. When I know the rest of the story, I sometimes forget to put myself in the shoes of that person. If this was the direction God was giving me in my life, would I respond the way Noah did? So we're going to slow down and we're going to do our best to remember if you know or if you think you know the end of the story, we're going to do that next week. But this week we're going to slow, we're going to pause, and we're going to think and ask some good questions about Noah. So we're reading from Noah, from Genesis chapter six. We're gonna skip a few verses. I'm actually not gonna tell you all the directions God gave him how to build the ark because I don't want you falling asleep at the beginning of my message, right? So we're gonna start in Genesis chapter six, verse five. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that the very intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heaven for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them on the earth, with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. And skipping ahead, for behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh and which is breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing, of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort of thing shall come into you to keep them alive. Also you shall take every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. And now we're going to set aside the rest of the story for next week. But we're going to stop there and we're going to pause and we're going to ask some questions. I'm going to ask the questions and you're going to do some thinking with me. So 60 to 70 years, Noah was a man. He was a man like, he was a human being like us. So did he grow weary? 60, 70, maybe 80, 90, 100 years building that ark from the time God gave him that plan that the earth was going to be preserved, mankind was going to be preserved through him. Did he grow weary? Did he question God's judgment? God came to him and said, I'm actually about to wipe out every human being. It's a heavy thought. It's a heavy reality. Did he question God's judgment? I think of later on, there's a story of Jonah, another well-known story, and God was just going to wipe out a city. And uh, 
Jonah went to, you know, went to talk to the people there, and then God saved them because they said they were sorry. And then Jonah got mad because God said he was going to do one thing, and then in Jonah's mind, he did another. Did any of these sorts of things? Did this humanity? Did this? Did any of this? Um, did Noah question God? Question his judgment? What did Noah's wife think? Now I'm married, and. Sometimes my husband has ideas, and I don't always think they're good ideas. And I wonder what Noah's wife thought. I wonder if over that passage of time she ever questioned him. What about his kids? His sons were adults. What about the neighbors and the people around him? Was he mocked? Was he persecuted? What was going on this passage of time? And yet Noah kept going. He kept building. He kept obeying what God had called him to do. Was he mocked? Was he questioned? What kept Noah going? He was by no means perfect. And as we explore more of his story next week, he was by no means perfect. Don't lose sight of that. We are talking about people like you and I who have doubts and questions and don't do things perfectly, and yet he endured. He kept going, and he built this ark. What sustained him? What did Noah, what did Noah know about God? We have a book. We have something we can read and look at. He didn't have the law or anything written. I think he had the stories of his, his ancestors. We weren't that far away from creation, and perhaps it was the oral tradition of what was passed down. But what did he know of God? What did he believe about God that really sustained him through this? 60, 70, 80, 90 years obeying what God had for him. You know, many centuries later, the author of Hebrews, Hebrews, like many centuries, the New Testament author writing to the church after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the author of Hebrews is, is writing and he's explaining to the hearer some things about faith. Faith, what it is to believe and to trust in God. What, what does this look like? And he began to tell it about faith in light of men like Noah and Abraham and those who had gone many centuries before. What did Noah know? What did Noah know about God? Hebrews chapter 11, pretty famous chapter on faith and on how faith played out in the lives of, of men and women. It says this, without faith, Without that belief and trust in God, it's impossible to please him, God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe, must believe that he exists, that there is a God. He exists. He's a creator of the world. And he must believe that God rewards, takes care of, looks after, embraces those who seek him. And then the very next sentence ties this to Noah. By faith, Noah. What do we know about the faith of Noah? We know, we know that he must have believed that God existed. And he must have known somewhere deep inside that God was one who rewards and looks after those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events yet unseen. For a very long time, I'm going to add, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. When the whole life of Noah is summed up, the author of Hebrews says one thing. In reverent fear, he built an ark. Reverent fear, that, that, confirmation that God existed and that he was going to look after him. By faith, Noah, warned by God concerning the things that were to come, what did he do? He did what God asked him to do. He obeyed. He built an ark. By faith, Noah being warned of the things to come, obeyed. But here's the thing now, stepping away from just Noah, because I do know the rest of the story. 
And the story that we're looking at, we are talking about one man in God's grand story that would be from beginning to end as we're studying in our series, God's Story. And here's what I do know. I know the rest of the story. And I know that from the creation of the world that was perfect, that man turned away from God, brokenness entered the world. The world was created perfect. Brokenness and sin entered the world. And then I know that through the life and death and resurrection of the Son of God, Jesus, that the beginning of the restoration of how God wanted things to be in the first place. You see, Noah saved a generation for a short amount of time, but they were still going to die. Noah's not here today. He rescued, and yes, mankind carried on. But there was one, Jesus, who came, and he didn't just rescue temporarily, but he provides for us the rescue of our souls, the rescue of our very lives. So I know the rest of the story. I know that the world was created perfect. The world was broken. And because of the brokenness, Jesus came and through his death, life, and resurrection, there is a promise of a future hope. So Noah was just one man, one man who, who through whom we can see some of who God is, not who Noah is. He's not the hero of the story. Ah, yeah, Noah obeyed God. Noah was the one guy at that time in history who was actually following God, and he obeyed God. But he's not the hero of the story. The hero of the story, the one we look to, is the one who through all time came, and he didn't just build an ark to save us, but he gave his own life. Noah, just one man, with one story in the great story of God. So we'll back up a little bit. Because we heard that Noah found favor. He found favor in God's eyes. And we're not told why. It doesn't say Noah found favor in God's eyes because he did. I'm really glad. I'll step aside. I'm really glad God doesn't didn't tell us that. Noah found favor because he did this, this, and this. Because then we can start to think, I'll find favor if I do this, this, and this. It says he found favor in the eyes of God. The King James, an old translation of the Bible, actually says that Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And you know, me, because I know the rest of the story beginning to end, I go, grace, I know that word. I know about grace. Because grace is that thing where I get what I really don't deserve because of what Jesus did for me. And I'm reminded of Ephesians chapter 2 that says, By grace you've been saved through faith. Ah, we heard about faith, the faith of Abraham. Uh, the faith of Noah that said, I'm going to build an ark. The faith that said, um, if I acknowledge that God exists and I believe he's one who's going to reward those who seek him wow that's faith by grace by the grace of god i've been saved through faith and it's not your own doing because it's so easy to start to think it's about me and about what i do and what i don't do no that faith and that grace that comes to us it's not your own doing it is the gift of god not as a result of works that none of us can boast so when I hear that Noah found favor in God's eyes and I remember that favor is grace and it's something freely bestowed upon me, I remember Jesus. I remember who he is and what he's done for me. The other thing we heard, we heard that Noah was described as a righteous man. A righteous just means you're in right standing with God. You are, in God's eyes, you're right. You're straight, you're true. And yet, what do I know about righteousness? I know later on, Abraham, it says, Abraham mm, believed God. He believed God. Faith, he believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. We heard Noah described as righteous, blameless in his generation. And then I remember some things about righteousness, that right standing with God. I remember some things about Jesus and my right standing with God. Second Corinthians says this, 
For our sake, he, being God, made him, Jesus, to be sin. In other words, to take on my wrongdoing, to be sin. Who knew no sin? Because we, Jesus looked up that Jesus truly lived a blameless life so that in him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. And there's an exchange that I don't deserve and you don't deserve. That by grace we get what Jesus did deserve, that acceptance, that acceptance in the eyes of God. God made Jesus, he took our, he took our fault, sin, blame, wrongdoing. We got, we, there was an exchange and we became righteous in the eyes of God. I remember the grace of God extended to me and I remember things like this. And when I think of Noah, and then I think of me, I think, hmm, I receive this right standing with God freely. And I think, well, that must be the same thing for Noah, not that he was a perfect man, but that he somehow knew something about God where that exchange of grace was made. And, he, and the scripture could say he's blameless in the eyes of God. He's found favor. He's found the grace of God. The right standing with God that I freely exchange and because I know the rest of the story, I remember a couple things. Lest I think too highly of myself, I remember first that Jesus said, you didn't choose me. Oh, well, sometimes we use that language, you know. We say, have you decided? And yet we realize later the great mystery is that for some reason, God chose you and he chose me. Jesus said, you didn't choose me. I chose you and I appointed you that you should bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And then I remember something Paul said. And I think of no one, I think of me. And Paul, as he was writing letters, most of the New Testament are things that Paul wrote. And he said this, that God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And I stop and I wait, yeah, he's talking about me. Because that great exchange that God made, because I could never be blameless in my own doing, but God says, it's okay, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Oh, and just so you keep this straight, I choose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And it brings us to a place, hopefully, of worship for all that God has done for us, for all that we didn't deserve. And we see Noah, and we see the deliverance that he brought for, for a time, but we see Jesus and the deliverance that he brought for all time. And thankfully, I remember that God chose Noah and he chooses me. So, why look at the life of a man like Noah as we're going through this series and we're looking at many of those early, we call them patriarchs or fathers of the faith. Why, why look at the life of somebody like Noah? Just to get some new information? As we started out today, we realized, mm, and when we read Genesis chapter 6, there's actually a lot of stuff we just don't know. We don't know how he felt. We don't know what, what, what on earth marked him as blameless. There's so many questions unanswered. So we're not looking for new insight, information, knowledge. Why look at the story of, of someone like Noah? Much later, Paul in the New Testament, his letter to the Romans, he, he wrote this. He said, um, whatever was written in the former days, whatever we had written down, whatever they had at that point in history, whatever was written down about the lives of the saints and, um, and those who had gone before them, the believers, whatever was written in the former days was actually written for our instruction. Because there's some things to instruct us, to change us. Why? That through endurance, Keep going. You know, Noah went day in, day out, year in, year out, with that, with that direction from God to build an ark. Did he grow weary? Yeah, my guess is he did. Did he ever say, really, God, you're going to destroy the whole earth, like my cousins and the neighbors? And did he ever say, like Abraham did once when God wanted was going to destroy something? Did a, a whole city? Abraham questioned God. He said, no. What if there's 10 righteous people? What if there's 10 people? Would you still destroy it? Did Noah ever question? We don't know. But we know that what we do know is therefore that we can endure. 
then we can keep going. It's there for our encouragement. It says through the encouragement of scriptures, we will have hope. And so we live lives of perseverance by the grace of God bestowed upon us, remembering that we're the foolish things of the world, that apart from that great exchange of his righteousness that he's given to us, we would, I don't know where I'd be today. So we look and we realize that, why do we look at someone like Noah? Yeah, some instruction so that we can have endurance encouragement and hope for our future now i'm pretty sure today that god isn't asking any one of us to build an ark but i believe god does ask things of us he reminds us that it's not in our strength it's by his grace that we're saved it's by his grace that we walk the life that we live and yet god still asks stuff of us and sometimes, you know, we want to come to church and hear something and sing, and, and it's good. And then we want to go have our coffee and visit with friends, and that's good. But today I want to stop for a minute. Because I know God asks things of us. And I know that there's the encouragement of the life of Noah is that faith means we're going to respond to those things. There might be some of you here today, your step of response to God, maybe you've been coming and hanging out with us a few Sundays here and there. Maybe you've never done that first thing, that first step that says, God, I acknowledge that you exist. And today's the day I'm going to put my faith and trust in you. And I'm going to believe, like Hebrews said, that you're going to look after me, that you're going to provide for a reward and take care of me as I take that step of faith. Maybe it's time for one or two of you in here to take that first step. Maybe it's time for some of us, and I put myself right now in this some of us, maybe there's something that, that I've let slide or I've never... Um, just been courageous enough to do. Maybe it might be a little more time searching and reading, looking for God in the Bible. Maybe you've let, maybe you've never, you know, really dug into this book to find out who God is and who he says he is. Maybe it's time to start. Maybe you've let it slide. Maybe it's time that, you maybe you've been hanging out here a little bit and now it's time to get a little more involved in community, time to get to know people, to walk out your Christian faith with. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's time to stop doing something you know you're not supposed to be doing. Yeah. Maybe it's time to take that little step and say, God, I think there's something I'm supposed to be doing here. And you know, the other thing is I was getting ready to Come, come up here. I was thinking about this the last week or two. And I was thinking, maybe it's time for some of us. Oh, this isn't for everybody, but I believe in here there's some of you that you know inside you that you're not going to be here forever in Toronto or maybe even in Canada. Maybe actually there's a drawing in the beginning of a tugging on your life that all, all of us are, need to search and seek and live our lives for God, but I believe there's some in here that your purpose in life, what God has for you, might be serving God on a church planting team, might be on the foreign mission field, might be going back to your country of origin to be part of seeing the, the, a church established there, seeing the gospel go forth. But whatever it is today, whether it's the first time, whether it's just time, uh, there's a change that you know God's putting in your heart, whether it's acknowledging maybe there's something greater that I'm supposed to be doing with my life. I've chosen this career path, and yet I know that God wants to use me 
maybe in a full-time capacity, and to build his kingdom. Are you willing? Are you willing to ask God? We're going to take a minute here, and we're going to actually just quietly reflect. We're going to reflect on this, because I believe that God exists, because that was the first part of faith, because I believe that God exists and that he rewards. Oh, don't just think gifts and, you know, I got a reward from my Tim Hortons roll up the rim. Think of that big God rewards, looks after, provides for, takes care of those who seek him. It's time for me to. And I want to take a minute quietly together. And I believe God speaks to our hearts as individuals. That's he wants that relationship with us. So let's just take a minute quietly. If you want to close your eyes, you can do that. You don't have to. And let's ask the Lord. Lord, is there something? Today, when you walked in, hopefully got a white card. We call it our next steps card. And some of the things are follow Jesus, get baptized, get involved in community here at the church. Maybe today it's a day to write something different on the white white card. I know it's time for me to. And whether you keep it for yourself or whether you turn it in, maybe it's just between you and God. And me, often my prayer in life is, Lord, help me to be willing to do your will. Help me to be willing. No one was willing to obey God, to follow God's directions. Help me to be willing. Father, we thank you for your word for those who have gone before us, for the instruction that comes to our own hearts to change us. In Jesus' name.